Um, on that note, I'd like to invite uh, Herr De Hade, thank you, <laughs> to, to speak to you. Um. <coughs> okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, I'd like to speak uh, about language learning or learning, but spe specifically language learning for visually impaired people. And I'm talking about not about just one of the projects that has been selected, you know, as best practice in this project, but uh, I'm talking actually about five projects. So the title is From Olvip to Molvis. And we have some strange subtitles here, uh, language learning for visually impaired people, or the difficulty how to include sighted people, what we call the normal people, so to say. And uh, but what I want to talk about, so we are talking about five projects, actually, a sequence of projects. And, uh, okay, technology. There we go. Okay. So I want to talk about a little bit about the story, what we did, what we learned within these projects, and what's coming next. Uh, we are talking about a time frame of 10 years with five projects. So if you compare it to, let's say, a TV series, you might call it season... So we are now at season five, starting with season one. And uh, season one was all VIP, Accessible Language Learning for Visually Impaired People. And it started 2005, it was a three-year project. And because with season one, you know, we have uh, the main plot is introduced, uh, we have the main characters are introduced in such a series, uh, you know, you notice our up the ups and downs and so on. So I will talk a little bit more about season one, all the, then t the other ones will be a little bit shorter. And we tried to create an English course for German learners and a German course for English learners. All the presentation slides are not really that interesting or a little bit boring. Uh, they're more a reminder for me, you know, to tell you more about it if you want to. The plot. It started actually in 2004 at the LearnTech in Karlsruhe. And uh, the partner of mine, Henning Pries from Tandem Hamburg, a language school, and uh, me, we were presenting a language learning project again. That was the Leonardo project at a booth. And at a neighbor booth, we saw a blind person. And she was, you know, uh, unpacking her uh, braille display. And we looked at her and said, hmm, wh wh why, why not create a language course for blind people? Well, well why not? So. Little we did a little bit of research and found out, okay, there is not that much material available for blind people. At least not material especially made for blind people, language learning materials. Then uh, there are a lot of blind people who can't read or write braille. Okay, that was news to us, but okay. And then we noticed that blind people, as long as they are in school, either in special schools for blind or in, in inclusive schools, no problem. But later in age, when they are adults, it becomes more and more difficult to get training because schools, even in classes, are not really prepared to include blind or visually impaired people. So we said, okay, let's take this into account. And we wanted to create a self-studying course for blind and visually impaired people for blind and visually impaired people who can't read or write Braille. And we wanted to create an innovative user interface made for blind people. That was the plot. Main characters. So to say, a force feedback joystick. We looked at game development at that time, and we found a force feedback joystick as an instrument to create a new user interface. Uh, you probably know a, jo a joystick. This is this thingy here at the, at the, the page. Force feedback means it has motors included. That's to say you can actually move the joystick 
The computer, you can control it. That's to say you can make it vibrate, you can make it move, actually. The idea was that you can actually lead a blind person to a certain spot on the screen. So the idea was to create a haptic interface using this type of joystick. Furthermore, the joystick gives you uh, absolute positioning on the screen, which is really important. Uh, the blind user can, it's di or let's say it's difficult for him or her to, to work with a mouse, almost impossible, because a mouse has relative positioning. The joystick has absolute positioning, great. And then 3D sound. Remembering, okay, no braille, no text, so sound. No images, of course, we're blind, you know. Yeah. Okay, no images, no video, sound. And we said, okay, 3D sound for orientation as well, using a headset. The other one that it's not really a main character in the set that was the authoring system with XML scripting, it's just a bi that was a byproduct. I mean, we had to create the course and the byproduct was an authoring system to create these courses. And as a main, s as a main first season goes, we had our ups and downs. We had most down, mostly downs actually in this project. And uh, but in the end, it worked out. We created the course or the two courses. And but at the end, the last moment, so to say, was more kind of a cliffhanger. So it worked. We were able to show. The technology works, blind people were able to use and uh, the, the program and learn with the product, but it was not far from perfect, so a kind of cliffhanger. Two years later, we were able to get funding for season two. That was Elvis, English language learning for visually impaired students. And if season one was like learning to walk, Elvis was, like, was more like growing up. We took Orbit, the English course, and improved it. We improved it now for Italian, French, German, and Romanian students, because everything has to be done, you know, because there's no text, also in their learner language instruction. It was a beginner's course. So we couldn't do everything in English, English. That was too difficult. And again, a self-learning course. And we, so to say, we developed the technology a little bit further. It was more stable, it was more usable for blind people. Which lead led us then to season three. Season two was, let's say, growing up. Season three was, let's say, becoming an adult in two ways. One adult theme was moving from general English course to a business-oriented or vocational English course, so a more adult topic or adult theme. The other one was, and this was maybe more important, was when you become an adult, you take responsibility. We were looking back at where we started, all of it. One reason to start the project was there are not that many schools, evening schools or so on, that offer uh, classes or that offer uh, classes for blind people or include blind people. And we said this hasn't, and we thought at that time we saw that hadn't changed. So we said, okay, for language schools, we want to develop a train the trainers course and to show normal teachers, so to say, how to include blind and visually impaired people into their classrooms and what the advantages are of doing that. Right. In this case, it's difficult to say whether this is actually th season three or is it spin-off of the original season. But uh, because we don't have that for week two right now, it's more probably season three. Which led us now to season four. That project, Accessible Language Learning for the Wellness Sector, has just more or less closed. And... Uh, what we did was putting, you know, starting to work was season one, growing up season two, season three was becoming an adult, and this was actually putting everything into practice what we already 
achieve. So we use the technology, the concepts, to create uh, a vocational English course that was aimed at people, blind and visually impaired people working in the wellness sector or in the combination of tourism and wellness sector. Because a lot of blind people work out working at masseurs, for example, especially in Austria, Germany, Romania, and Italy. And because wellness and uh, tourism is now more and more connected, you need some basic language skills, especially if you're dealing with foreign guests. So that was the idea. Uh, so here we are, season four. and which was satisfying in a way, not really exciting, it was not really boring, but it was okay to put everything into practice what we've learned. Season four, five, sorry, season five. Uh, there's always a time when you have to look back in a way of trying to look forward, that's to say, try to rethink what you've done, try to redefine what you are doing. So we said, okay, we, we have to take the next step. It's okay what, what we were doing, but uh, let's go on. And the idea was uh, to transfer the technology we already had, which was accessible. It was accessible language learning, an accessible course for blind and visually impaired people on the Windows desktop. Try to transferred to mobile devices. There were a couple of reasons for that. One reason was that in the meantime, a lot of blind people use smartphones, especially the Apple smartphones, because these smartphones have an accessible user interface implemented. So we said, okay, let's transfer our already accessible program to these devices. That was the main, main idea. And uh, that's what we did, and are uh, still doing. This project was finished in March next year. And we are developing now the apps for iOS, Android, mobile, Windows mobile phone, and of course still for Windows desktop. So it will be a multi-platform uh, system. And we are developing a German tool for German. Why not? And this time for Dutch, English, Italian, Romanian, and Turkish learning. Now, what did we learn by doing this? I mean, we are talking now about a sequence of five projects funded by the European Commission. Ten years of working with blind people. In every project, there were schools for the blind involved, at least three or four schools for the blind. Language schools were involved, usually a university as well, giving some pedagogic and technical input, and sometimes programming. Well, what did we learn? We had to redefine our conception of blindness. Uh, luckily, Henning and I, when we applied for the first project, we didn't know what we were dealing with. Otherwise, we wouldn't have started the project. Uh, with the first project, all of a sudden we had all different kinds of learners. We had very young learners, blind learners, we had adult learners, we had learners that were brilliant with the computer, no problem, they were whiz kids in a way. And then we had learners with multiple disabilities. We didn't know at that time that blindness is usually accompanied, is not usually accompanied by another uh, disability, but usually caused by another problem. So we had all kinds of different uh, people. And we always thought at the beginning, okay, yes, you've got blind people, so you could focus on sound because they all have good hearing. No, that's not true. Some have, yes, okay. Or we said, okay, they, they can touch, you know, they can feel very well. No, well, yes, sometimes they do. So that was a surprise. Okay, but we managed. We estimated the amount of work, work that we had to do. We tried to create a new user interface for blind people, so everything had to be somehow explained. So we used a huge amount of sound files. You had to give the information, where are I am? Where am I now? You know, uh, what page, what unit? Uh, you have to give an instruction what to do in this case. 
you have to maybe give some help how to do a certain activity. He had a lot amount, a huge amount of information. He had to produce. Meaning each course then consisted of something like uh, 10,000 uh, sound tracks, which was more than we expected at the beginning. We didn't know that replacing a visual interface with a kind of sound interface would take that much work. But fortunately, we were right in limiting of what we wanted to do. We tried to, we said, okay, we wanted to create a course for people who can't read and write well. So we were focusing on listening, we were focusing on understanding, on activities with listening and understanding, and focusing a little bit on speaking pronunciation training. And that was good, because we were focusing on a certain, just a certain amount of activity. We didn't want to do everything. So that was unintentionally, but it was okay. Now we are coming to the second point, actually, you know, how, why it is difficult to include sighted learners. We are slowly approaching that part. That for whip, that was a turning point in it's season three, so that's the middle of now of one to five. And uh, it was a turning point in a way that our target group was now not only blind people, but it was teachers, normal people teachers, not specialized teachers, you know, who train blind people, but normal teachers. So normal teachers in their classroom. And what we found out, and we did some, we set up, you know, within the project, when we tried out and uh, tested, you know, our learning concept and the materials, we set up mixed classes. And what we found out was that having blind students in the classroom does indeed improve learning for the other people. And this was an unexpected side effect. Now, why, why was that? First of all, what we had here, somehow learning tandems developed, or people helped each other. People explained. That was good. Let's say once the initial uh, obstacles were removed, like, okay, a teacher was afraid, you know, you know, okay, there's a blind person. What what shall I do? Have have I do I have to take him by the hand and lead him to 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 the chair? You know, I I don't have any materials. You know, I'm, I'm not prepared. You know, what's the problem really? Once we got that solved, and that was relatively easy to solve, uh, we found out that it improved learning in a way because some all of a sudden certain exercises made sense or made more sense. For example, typical thing, describing situations, describe a picture. Well, if you see a picture, why should I describe it, you know? But describe it to a blind person in a foreign language. All of a sudden, you know, you're not just trying to describe it more precisely, but you get questions. Oh, and you have to answer. Communication between people is all of a sudden different. You can't... Uh, rely on uh, gestures anymore and facial expressions to help maybe communication. It's just plain text, vocal voice. So that, that's an improvement. The other thing was it improved teaching. Now that was another surprise. Uh, first of all, the teacher, because there were blind person you know, in the classroom, they had to modify their teaching, create, let's say, either use new methods or accompany the old methods with new kind of input. Just imagine you have, you're writing something down, uh, down you know, uh, something at the blackboard or whiteboard. You can't just do that. You have to write something and then s at least say it aloud. But what we found out is, okay, people were then repeating what was, you know, on the blackboard, but they were at the same time explaining. Now, that was good for the blind person, definitely, but it was also good for all those learners who were not so, let's say, who were not of a visual learning type, but who were more of an auditory learning type. That was great for all of them. And the other thing was, and this is now really interesting, 
we had also a learning course using joystick, of course, and uh, a, a computer. And this was the, fir the first time it was introduced to normal sighted learners. And it was very interesting, you know, how they reacted to that kind of course. I will come to that a little bit later. Which is, in a way, what's coming next, or what is already approaching, so to say. First of all, for us as uh, a project, creating an app or a learning program for mobile devices and Windows desktop is a great thing because we just get a wider audience, which is good. As simple as that, because especially maybe also for young people who are used to use a smartphone, it's just a normal device for learning. Uh, and based on the Web for Wit experience, we wanted to include sighted learners because we said, okay, we made the experience that in Web for Wit, our program worked also for sighted people. So why not now don't do a specialized program for blind people? It should work with blind people, yes, but also make it attractive for sighted learners. And uh, but, and this is now the problem, we have the big challenge of focus on single media. What does it mean? Uh, as a project manager who leads a project meeting, you probably know the situation. There you are, and all your project partners, they have their notebook open, they are multitasking, they are reading their emails, they are answering their emails, they are doing their business while they are actively encouraging uh, participating in the meeting. So, and you as a project manager, you know, you think, I don't think I have their full attention somehow. But we are all multitasking. And uh, so, what our experience was with multitasking is that people especially now are not only multitasking but multimedia and single media is that people now and learners expect a full, fully blown pro uh, program, learning program. Yes, of course, there has to be text in there, there has to be images in there. You need probably video. The more input, the more channels, the better learning. That is the idea behind it. And you get these programs. So, uh, great, you know, it's, it's, it's multimedia, you know, here and there, and, you know, the old singing, old dancing program with the kitchen sink in it. So, and we had the problem because this is what our program looks like. On the desktop version, you don't even have these, uh, these images. This is a dialogue task. That's to say you're listening to a dialogue and you can listen to the, uh, when you activate this button, when you activate this button, you hear the uh, translation if you want to. Here you get the vocabulary. These are just uh, some icon thingies, you know, with uh, which helps you to navigate. That's a matching task. You all know, uh, you know, drag and drop activities. You know, you have to match pairs by a drag and drop. You can actually do that with blind people using either joystick or uh, the, this interface. Now, what we found out with that for VIP was when we, when some of our sighted learners used our program, that they closed their eyes. So, and we thought, wh why are you doing this? You know, because you have a visual interface. I mean, uh, okay, admittedly, there's not a lot going on there, but how do you close your eyes? You say, well, it helps me. It helps me focusing. It helps me listening. I have to concentrate. And they actually noticed that when closing their eyes, you know, they learned better. They also learned, you know, with opening their eyes, you know, and doing that, but it was better. They, they were more able to focus, which is... A problem. We are all multitasking. You know, we are losing focus. Uh, I once, a couple of months ago, I read an article saying, 
you know, if you have read this article, you know, up to this point, you know, most people would actually have left this article. There are only so and so many people who actually read the whole article anymore. So it seems to be, and when you look at schools, that people unlearn to focus and to concentrate for a longer time on something. So our idea is now saying what we have here is not a bug, it's a feature. Use single media, use multi not multimedia. Don't be distracted by text, by images, you know, just have a plain, easy to use uh, interface and uh, that actually helps you learn. The problem is now convincing sighted learners, especially on smartphones, that this is good for you. You have to make the experience. But the problem is now convincing them to, to do this, to get, let's say, to spend half an hour with the program and then you will notice, oh yes, you learn. So this is now our problem we are having. This is the problem we are having, you know, how to, to include sighted learners now. We made a product that really works, a method that really works for blind people, that also is very effective for sighted people, but now we have to convince them that this simple thing is actually what you need. So, what's coming next, or what is coming already more or less, is a simple and easy to use interface that works for both blind and sighted learners. So, in, th in this sense, we don't want interference, in this case, of text. We won't have any text on the screen. Uh, images or video helping you to focus on the task. And the task here is listening, understanding, exercising that, and pronunciation training. Actually, you can, even on a smartphone, you can, if, if you want to, you can make the screen totally dark. And you can still work also as a sighted learner with the program. But it's not as nice as with the joystick, so we have to have a minimum user interface. So what we experienced with that for WIP, that was our, our motto, so to say, access and inclusion, promoting language learning for all, got a turn within our project that we said, okay, let's open up for sighted people. And that was a surprise uh, and a new development, and which we are going to develop further with probably season six, we are thinking about that right now, and uh, let's see how this evolves. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. That is absolutely properly fascinating. <laughs> really, that is that's great. Um, it's great to see it going on so long. We're going to use the same mic. I'm sure. I have no doubt at all. They're going to be plenty of questions, but because um, we need to use this one microphone, I'm going to be going, Tim will be going up and down. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. <coughs> uh, my question is a little bit complicated. I have the experience to say it in very simple words and uh, ask for your experience that your approach you used uh, to develop your tools and methods is based on experience, on trial and error, and even a lot of experience. But now, the understanding of how our brain is functioning is ongoing, <coughs> and there is very rapid development. Also we know in between that we have more cells in the brain than stars in the galaxy, and that all the areas of the brain are interconnected, interrelated. And so that maybe all the different senses are intercorrelated and uh, connected and that maybe uh, some, um, what we uh, normally understand that people which are visual impaired have a much better feeling or uh, acoustic, uh, uh, acoustic uh, reception and uh, my question is, to which extent, why I believe that you are much more familiar with that field, uh, did you get um, support, understanding, help, scientific uh, new results which helps to develop your approach even in the future?
yes, thank you. Uh, what we found out in, in a way was, if you might call it lucky finding, it was a coincidence, so to say. I mean, it was not something we wanted to show or wanted to achieve. It was something we discovered, so to say. And uh, with that ProVip. And that ProVip is in a way uh, a good example because what you actually are doing is you have the joystick and a headset. You don't need to see the screen, so no visual input. So you can actually, whatever you do, and uh, so you have this haptic feedback and, uh, and the sound. And we found out that this actually helped also uh, sighted people because they there was no, ag again, no interruption from text or video and so on. But this was experience. We tested it and we found out actually it worked. Now we are testing it with the apps. It's just again something where you say, okay, it seems to work, at least with joystick and so on. So the reduction of uh, senses, so to say, or let's say of or let's say of multimedia input, not of the senses, but of multimedia input like text, image, and so on, obviously seems to help uh, in this special context because we are talking about uh, listening, understanding, and comprehension. So in this case, it does help, obviously, by reducing you know input. We'll see how this works out in this project. If this is true then we might take actually the next step where we say, okay, let's go a little bit more, you know, in the step of research, because that's what we didn't do. And this is a nice step. Another thing is, for example, the impact of sound. Uh, there is some res research telling you that background sound, whatever it is, can stimulate or can... Uh, can stimulate learning or can actually can be an obstacle. So far we don't have any background sound. Uh, but it could very well be that research in that area might also uh, go into the next project. So we are not, not sure yet how, how the this, this goes. It will a little bit depend on what we are doing now, our experience, but if we find out that sighted learners also work and learn with our product and uh, that it works well even with sighted learners, then we will definitely go in this direction. But yeah, again, no, re no research so far, just coincidence, and let's, let's see how it works out. And we might need research, yeah, to go on. We have the, uh, uh, in, in this, the new project, we have the University of Edinburgh is partner. They are also evaluating the, the project. So there will be an evaluation report. And from their, I guess, from, from their perspective, uh, th they probably want to go on there and, and start maybe a little bit more in that direction. Yeah. Hopefully they will do. absolutely uh, fascinating and you've partly answered my question to the last thing you said there about the evaluation from the University of Edinburgh but I wondered if that evaluation the, the, the out it's very complicated to evaluate outcomes in projects like this if so uh, what what are you looking for is what does success look like I suppose is the question is it what people the learners know is it about their disposition to further learning is it what they're using those skills to do is I wonder if you could just share your thinking on that. It's a very complicated area. I'm sorry to summarise in a very small space. I'm going to do the walking for a moment just so Tim can compose himself after nearly a dozen pancakes. Uh, okay, there are at least right at the moment two areas we, we are evaluating. One thing is the uh, accessibility issue. Problem is, as we what we found out is that Android and iOS are 
pretty accessible from the system uh, operating system point of view. Windows Mobile is not as, as advanced, but uh, it's, it's growing. Now, we already had an accessible uh, program, accessible learning app. We found out that combining an, an already accessible learning app with an already accessible operating system doesn't work at all. It clashes. So uh, the problem is that the system functions are pretty much accessible, but within the apps, it's, it's that is not the case anymore. So uh, this is the, the testing from the technology point of view or from the usability point of view. We have, uh, just a moment, one, two, three, we have four uh, schools and institutions for the blind in the project, so we have uh, a quite a broad uh, uh, testing uh, platform for that. That's, that's one point. It's a purely, so to say, technical usability point of view. Uh, the other thing is then, okay, does it actually support learning? <laughs> and the problem, of course, is in this that we can tell from a certain point of view, well, we have language schools in, in the project, and the schools for the blind themselves, they teach languages, in this case, also German, especially the Dutch part maybe, and also the Italian part maybe. So what they are doing is uh, they have their students, they ha make an assessment how far they are with German, and then they actually let them go either on their own with the product, or they include certain, uh, let's say, uh, parts or units in their classroom. And together with the University of Edinburgh, we created a kind of uh, yes, a template for uh, uh, charging in, you know, this is now how they are, you know, and what has been improved, especially with regard to understanding, of course, and pronunciation training. The uh, problem is that we can't really uh, test the long-term effect. Uh, that, that's tricky. Uh, that's something we can't do, simply because technical development, unfortunately, takes a little bit, not well, it takes actually too much time to, to test that. Uh, uh, sorry about <laughs> But but the focus is not so much on usability actually, because uh, if something doesn't work, uh, then we change the act type of activity to make, you know, to to, uh, to to create something new. So the focus indeed is on learning, not so much on on technology. In this case. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very good presentation.